Regenerative medicine is one of the fastest growing fields with new papers published every single day. As a busy mom of two, I'm guilty of not making the time to keep up with the research, and I think a lot of other veterinary professionals are in the same situation. My name is Dr. Adrian Wright, and welcome to Sit, Stay, Learn, a short podcast where I review regenerative medicine uses in veterinary science. Each episode, I break down a paper, and then we spend 10 or 15 minutes just giving you the details that you need to know to feel like you're staying on top of the research. For today's paper, I chose a prospective pilot clinical trial. So this is a preliminary small scale study with the goal to test methods and feasibility for those larger planned trials. So remember, these type of papers have a little less control, uh, smaller sample sizes, uh, I would say less conclusive outcome measures, but they're still useful. The purpose of this podcast is really just to stay on top of the literature, and by doing that, we're going to review a healthy mix of different studies. So in this pilot study, they used platelet-rich plasma, or PRP, as we all lovingly know it, uh, for treatment of degenerative joint disease, or DJD, in cats. This paper was published in 2024. Um, and it is in Frontiers of Veterinary Science, and it comes primarily from a practice in Ontario. To highlight the study design, the objective was to evaluate the effectiveness of a single intraarticular or IA injection of autologous PRP um, for managing DJD in cats. They used six domestic client-owned cats that have been clinically and radiographically diagnosed with DJD. Clinical assessment pre- and post-injection was assessed using the feline musculoskeletal pain index score as well as the visual analog scale at day zero, so baseline, and then two, four, and six weeks. The cats average around nine years old and the mean body weight was around six and a half kilograms. There is no control group here due to the nature of the study. Does that weaken the report? Yes. Is this data still valuable? 100% yes. They make no comment on the sex of the cats. We would just have to assume that it's a mixture, but I would have liked to see that addressed. Here they are using client-owned animals, so this is naturally occurring DJD versus some experimental models. And personally, I really like that. Experimental models do have their place from a control aspect, but I do like the use of naturally occurring models whenever possible. It does represent more accurately what is being seen in practice, and it takes into account a lot of factors um, like environmental factors, for example, that you do lose in an in a experimental model. So study subjects were identified both from clinic records and then from referring DVMs that had seen advertisements for this trial. Uh, they had a total of eight cats that were screened, but two were excluded for baseline blood work that suggested a systemic disease. The inclusion criteria was that they had to be over one year of age, weigh at least five pounds, had one or more symptoms of chronic pain related to, D to DJD as noted by their owner, evidence of pain during manipulation of at least two joints during a veterinary orthopedic evaluation, lastly, radiographic evidence of DJD in at least one of the two painful joints that they had. The exclusion criteria was just the normal ones like a uh, presence of a suspected or diagnosed infectious disease or symptomatic cardiac disease, immune mediated disease, neoplasia, active UTI, hyperthyroidism, chronic kidney disease, or diabetes. These were ruled out in multiple ways. So they assessed the medical records, they had owner history, physical exam, CBC, serum biochemistry panel, and urine analysis. But they also excluded if thrombocytopenia was evident on the baseline blood work. So if we dive into the topic a little bit, DJD, some call it OA, it's just a progressive breakdown of the cartilage in the joint. Pain in the joint, stiffness, swelling, reduced range of motion, joint instability, those are all things that you're going to see with DJD. 
I feel like DJD is less recognized in cats um, when you compare it to dogs, but it's still a huge problem, especially as they age. It's estimated that over 90% of cats over the age of 15 are affected. And it can present with subtle clinical signs, so it makes diagnosis really challenging, and then it's probably underdiagnosed. But besides age, you have other risk factors. You have genetics, obesity, trauma. We know a lot of cats suffer from these. And the current treatment really just focuses on pain management through medication and rehab, but these both come with variable results and sometimes even negative side effects, especially with that long-term medication use. So this group makes the popular argument that more safe and effective options are needed, and I agree with that. So here's where we introduce PRP. In my opinion, PRP is a great entry into regenerative medicine. It's non-invasive, it's just a simple blood draw, it's a low price point compared to other options, and it's quick and easy to do in the clinic. PRP uses the platelets in the blood. We're simply concentrating them above baseline values. Three to five times is the general rule of thumb. I think this group reports as low as one and a half. I would still be looking for that three to five. Then we activate them to burst the platelets open and we collect the growth factors that are present in the alpha granules for their natural therapeutic potential. This paper used a different product. I know that there are others on the market, but I stand behind Ardent's PRP. It's affordable, it's quick to process, and it has been characterized in an earlier paper from Dr. Sam Franklin at the University of Georgia, showing the platelet concentration is in that target three to five times and we did have reduced leukocyte formulation. And just remember, not all PRPs are the same. So actually one of the five that Dr. Sam Franklin tested actually decreased the platelets from the baseline. And also some products don't activate or lyse their platelets prior to injection. And I don't think you can really depend on the body to lyse all of those platelets. Um, compared to when you're doing an activation in the tube like we do, where you can actually see the formation of that fibrin clot and know that we've lysed the platelets. Um, but the choice of PRP as a therapeutic here makes sense. PRP signals growth factors, reduces inflammation, promotes tissue healing. And studies involving PRP with canines and equines for OA and tendon injuries have demonstrated positive results and suggests that PRP can enhance joint function, reduce pain, and improve quality of life. This paper um, is the first demonstrating the use in felines. Okay, so we'll get to the treatment real quick. They used 12 and a half mils of whole blood. Ardent's kit is also really easy um, to modify to the animal size, so you can collect as little as eight mils or as much as 36 mils with one single kit. PRP was processed, they did an IA injection, needle placement confirmation was obtained by collection of joint fluid. Personally, really not a fan of that here. Um, joint fluid collection may not be feasible, especially for those advanced cases. There may be little to no joint fluid to collect. And two, I think getting near the joint is still getting the PRP to the area. But if you're gonna confirm where you're at, I think ultrasound alone would have been fine here. They do a single injection in the joint, half mil for a hip stifle or shoulder, and 0.25 mils for an elbow. This is where the paper loses me a little bit. I feel like the volume for the hip, shoulder, and stifle is a little much for cats. This small, we typically recommend more in the range of 0.25 to 0.3 um, for animals that are less than 25 pounds. They also didn't inject the same joint for animals. So for me, this is introducing just another variable on top of a pretty uncontrolled experiment. Um, you already have a small sample size. So you only have six cats. Now you've mentioned four joints being injected. And there's always a chance that certain joints respond better or worse to, treat, to treatment. So either way, I would have liked to see them limit to a single joint um, or maybe have multiples of each joint, even just two to three. Um, let's say they do say that the most common joint injected was the elbow, but that also four or six of the cats needed bilateral injections, but really no other information is provided here. I would have liked to see this broken down a little more. For the analysis, owners and veterinarian were to score the cat um, at baseline and then two weeks, four weeks, and six weeks post-injection. So here I think the paper gets a little tough to follow. Basically owners are using the FMPI 
and then they were also trained to analyze or detect pain in cats. Veterinarians used the visual analog scale. For owners, there were 19 questions, but 18 and 19 were not answered at all time points. And then for vets, all of the questions of the visual analog scale were asked at all time points. They also did a mathematical conversion to make the scores align for the whole study. Like I said, the scoring gets a little murky. So um, if you want more details on that and what they did, they do cover it very thoroughly in the outcome measurement section, but we'll just get to the results of these injections. So for the owner ass assessment, significant improvement was seen at two weeks compared to day zero, and again at four compared to zero and six compared to zero. They did not compare like two to four, four to six, et cetera, but they do account in the statistics for multiple comparisons, which I did appreciate. Um, and then this is referencing that shorter set of questions. So I think that was questions one through 17. For the full 19 questions, they assessed those at day zero and at the end at six weeks, those results also showed significant improvement. But the bulk improvement is seen in most cats by the owner in the first two weeks. Is some of it placebo effect? Possibly. Um, but one cat actually went to 100% and then maintained that for the rest of the study, while a couple of others really jumped up in that two weeks, and then they decreased in later time points. Uh, for the veterinarian scoring, they also saw significant improvement, but it wasn't until four and six weeks. So although the scores did improve at two weeks, it was not significant. I think the p-value was like 0.11. Um, this leads me to believe that the big jump in two weeks with owners definitely had some placebo effect. But veterinarians did also see the biggest jump of improvement between week zero and two. Um, and improvements were minimal through the six weeks. No adverse events were reported in this study as we expected. But in the discuss discussion section, this group does make an interesting point that feline platelets are larger than other species. So this includes humans, cat, um, humans, dogs, and horses. And they make the hypothesis that larger platelets have a larger number of granules, a greater capacity for protein synthesis, and greater amounts of secretory products when compared to smaller platelets, and thus could be considered more active functionally. I'm not sure if this translates to therapeutic benefit or if the body's just going to see improvement regardless because you're concentrating it to their baseline. But this is an interesting point. I would like to look into it further and see if any work's been done. Um, but also to me, I think you have to consider that for cats, you have less blood volume available compared to some other species, and thus you do have a limited in product. So perhaps it is all just a wash. You may have um, a smaller volume that's more concentrated and then more volume that's less concentrated. But either way, I would like to measure the growth factors in our product across species just to see. Um, overall, I think this paper was, I think it was okay. Uh, I liked the PRP use for cats. I loved the naturally occurring DJD model. I would have liked to see more outcome measures, even just one or two more. But again, the point of these studies is exploratory and small, so I do get it. I would have liked to see a few more cats um, and maybe just some more information in the paper altogether. So I think there's things they went into a lot of detail and somewhere they just kind of glazed over it. Um, you know, and they really could have got creative with their controls. So maybe even just following a couple of cats in the practice that were on just the standard of care and scoring them for comparison would have been helpful here. But the takeaway is that the study did demonstrate that intraarticular PRP did improve the clinical outcome for cats with DJD um, with similar improvements from seen by both the owners and the veterinarians. Definitely needs more controlled study, larger sample sizes, and I would like to see cats followed more long term, maybe even do some multiple injections. But that's all for today. So what are your thoughts on this paper? Do you use Ardent's PRP for cats with DJD? Just dogs? If so, what results are you seeing? We would love to hear. 
For the text version of this episode, you can head to our blog. If you have questions on this episode or a paper that you'd like for me to review, you can always email me at adrian at I hope you all have a wonderful week. See you next time.